Let's face it, spam is weird stuff. It might look like a block of mystery meat and taste suspiciously delicious, but it turns out there's a lot that goes into each and every can of spam. Here's how spam is really made. Spam is a weird thing, a tin of long-lasting, weirdly textured, inexplicably good meat product. Things like spam don't just happen. Someone had to intentionally do this. The question is why and how? Spam has its origins in the late 20s, when Jay Hormel took over his father's meat company. Hormel was always looking for the next big thing, so when he saw a deli selling canned meat carved into slices, he latched onto the idea. The meat was originally formed into six-pound molds, and customers who wanted some had it sliced at the deli. Hormel figured he could cut out the middleman and sell miniature canned meats directly to people who could then slice it themselves. The idea for Spam was born, though it would take a few years to be perfected, finally debuting in 1937. Hormel decided early on that Spam would primarily consist of pork shoulder, a part of the pig that at the time was rarely used as it was difficult to process. Spam starts looking less like pigs and more like Spam when the meat is sliced from the bone, a process done by hand, and ground into 8,000-pound batches. These days, given the worldwide popularity of Spam, the company needs a lot of piggy shoulders to meet demand, which is why their partners at Quality Pork Processors, Inc. slaughter over 20,000 pigs every single day. Most domestic Spam is processed in Nebraska, but Hormel also has overseas plants in South Korea, the Philippines, and Denmark. Spam has an image of being mostly a weird sort of mystery meat, but there's only six ingredients – pork with ham, salt, water, potato starch, sugar, and sodium nitrite. That's it. Still, you might be wondering why some of those ingredients are in your meat to begin with. The sodium nitrate is there to prevent the growth of bacteria that can cause food poisoning if it's ingested, since no one wants their Spam with a side of botulism. It's also what gives Spam that distinctive pink color, thanks to a chemical reaction that happens between the nitrates and the protein in the meat and the potato starch helps to hold everything together while preventing the meat from drying out too much in the can. It's actually a recent addition to the recipe, as it was only added in 2009. After the meat is hand-carved from the bone, it's ground up in 8,000-pound batches. A metal detector is used to make sure nothing has gotten into the batch in any part of the process. And then it's transferred to a series of vacuum mixers that are capable of super-chilling the batch to freezing. The rest of the ingredients are dumped in, the mixer is sealed to be airtight, and it's mixed. Why the cold in the vacuum? It's to help prevent a huge amount of liquid from being released when the meat is cooked. Once the Spam is all perfectly mixed, it's funneled into the cans, which are vacuum-sealed, giving Spam its infamously long shelf life. How long? Hormel says if you store it properly, a can of Spam could last indefinitely. Usually, though, it starts to go off about five years after its Best Buy date. So if you've got some old Spam in your doomsday bunker, you should probably eat it now. I have the best stocked survival shelter in northeastern Pennsylvania. But everything has a shelf life, so I must eat and then replace everything that's about to expire. Once the Spam is canned, then it's time to cook it. Yes, it sounds backwards, but Spam is actually cooked inside the can. The cans are sent to a massive hydrostatic cooker, where the cans are cooked, sterilized, washed, and finally cooled. How big is the machine? It can actually process up to 33,000 cans every hour. And they need to make that many cans because despite being a punchline to some, Hormel estimates they sell three cans every second, with over 8 billion cans sold since Spam was first introduced. That's way more than just a mere ton of Spam, literally, as it just takes 2,666 cans of Spam to equal one ton. There's no signs that interest in Spam is going away anytime soon, either, as it shows up in an estimated one in three American households. But that doesn't hold a candle to some of the biggest Spam consumers in the world. Spam is especially popular in Hawaii and Guam, where the canned meat became a beloved dietary staple when Allied troops introduced it to locals during World War II. Hawaii and Guam both buy for the crown of the most spam-happy place on Earth. But at last calculation, the crown was officially held by Guam, where the average citizen consumes 16 cans of spam per year. You can even get it at McDonald's. Everyone's familiar with those distinctive blue and yellow cans, right? Absolutely! And that's what makes it so surprising that there's an extra step that goes into the making of Spam in South Korea. It's often packaged up as part of a gift set. The New York Times looked at South Korea's favorite gifts for the Lunar New Year. It was a list that included things like rare tea, imported wines, fine cuts of beef, and Spam. American soldiers also brought Spam with them to South Korea during the Korean War in the 1950s, which is why Spam is today considered a luxurious delicacy. In fact, it's often given as a sign of respect to important people during the Christmas season. As one saleswoman told the New York Times, here, Spam is a classy gift you can give to people you care about during the holiday. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oof. That's the sound of quality. <laughs> there are plenty of people out there who would argue that McDonald's world-famous fries are the best thing to come out of the Golden Arches. But how did they actually end up on your tray or in that drive-thru bag? Let's find out. 
McDonald's decided to share all about how their famous fries are made after years of people asking if they used some sort of potato goo to get the process started. Well, there's no goo here. According to McDonald's, their world-famous fries start with whole, fresh-from-the-ground potatoes grown on U.S. farms. The potatoes McDonald's uses are so ideal for their famous fries that they weren't willing to stray from them a few years ago and move to another option. When J.R. Simplot engineered the innate potato, a variety that would bruise less and release fewer compounds when fried, a McDonald's spokesperson said they had no intention of switching to the GMO product. They said, McDonald's USA does not source GMO potatoes, nor do we have current plans to change our sourcing practice. Long live the real potato! McDonald's serves up a very specific shape of fry, and that comes from the way the potatoes are cut. The potato cutting machine looks like a giant wood chipper shooting potatoes into high-pressure water knives at 60 to 70 miles per hour. One McDonald's factory employee on Reddit went even further to describe the machine's incredible strength, making it sound, well, terrifying. They said, quote, "...somebody stepped in a water waste flume once and got sucked under and almost drowned. Someone passing by had to pull him out. This wasn't a flume where fries go, but it still has water moving about the same speed." For the flumes that carry product, just imagine a few hundred pounds of fries every minute going by at lightning speed. If you look closely at McDonald's ingredient list for their fries, you'll notice a few ingredients that definitely aren't potatoes. Two of those, dextrose and sodium acid pyrophosphate, are added at the factory, essentially giving the cut potatoes a nice chemical bath. There's no need to worry, though. According to Healthline, dextrose is a simple sugar made from corn, which is often used as a sweetener. The Center for Science in the Public Interest says sodium acid pyrophosphate actually reduces the levels of acrylamide, a carcinogen present when potatoes are fried, so there might be some chemical additions we should be applauding. As an added bonus, they also help keep those fries a delicious golden color, no matter where in the world you order them. Once the fries are cut and bathed, they're partially fried at the factory to speed up the cooking process later on once they arrive in stores. According to one McDonald's factory employee's AMA on Reddit, the processing is all part of setting the store up for success. Uncooked food is harder to manage bacteria growth. It's also easier if the restaurants can just reheat than actually cook. The fries then travel about 50 yards through a flash freezer tunnel to complete the process, which is crucial for their uniform appearance and storage. One of the most unique additives you'll see listed among McDonald's French fries ingredients is their, quote, natural beef flavor. Yes, you heard that correctly, natural beef flavor. And we owe it to that added beef flavor for not being able to put those beautiful French fries down. Years ago, McDonald's used to fry their French fries in beef fat, and it just became part of their signature flavor. According to NPR, the company switched to a vegetable oil base to quell concerns about saturated fat, but still incorporated essence of beef until vegetarian groups protested. Today, McDonald's continues to mimic that flavor with the help of their natural beef flavor containing hydrolyzed wheat and hydrolyzed milk, which makes it safe for vegetarians, but not vegans. During service, especially during busy times, fries are made pretty much constantly. When it's time to put a fry basket down, the fries are actually designed to cook within three minutes, all thanks to the preparation beforehand in the factory. At one time, McDonald's used a partially hydrogenated oil for their fries, until they completely switched over in 2008 to eliminate trans fats. They spent seven years on the hunt for a replacement, testing 18 different types of oils before they ultimately decided on Clear Valley High Oleic Canola Oil, which allowed McDonald's to fry in an oil with no trans fats and the lowest saturated fat content of any of the vegetable oils. According to McDonald's, they figured out the ideal amount of salt for their fries based on their customers. In answering one of their FAQs on the McDonald's UK website asking about why McDonald's fries have so much salt on them, they responded by explaining, "...extensive research has shown that the majority of McDonald's consumers prefer a light sprinkling of salt on their french fries. A typical serving of a small portion of french fries contains 0.5 grams of salt." With that standard, that puts a small order of fries serving up to 160 milligrams of sodium and large with 350 milligrams of sodium. Compared to your daily recommended amount of sodium of around 1,500 milligrams, that's not outrageous after all, is it? 
McDonald's Canada took to their website to answer the many questions their customers have about their food, and one popular topic was how long fries sit in the heat tray before they are finally discarded. Corporate told one inquirer, The longest amount of time will keep our world-famous fries before serving them to you is seven minutes, but their popularity means they're usually on your tray and in your mouth much faster than that. No, sorry, mate. Five-second rule. I thought it was a ten-second rule. No, it's definitely five seconds. Uh, seven? Righto, seven. Six and seven. Time's up. And what about the thing where customers think they're pulling one over on Mickey D's by asking for fries with no salt just to get a fresh batch? According to another crew member on Reddit, all you need to do in order to get fresh fries is ask. Did you know that you can simply ask for fresh fries if that's what you wanted? They'll actually most likely be newer than asking for no salt. But if you do ask for fresh fries, be sure to remember they will take a few more minutes than normal. One employee told Reddit it takes about three and a half minutes to complete the order. And that's actually not long at all to wait for that box of golden deliciousness. KFC has long been a frontrunner for fast food Southern staples, mainly because of its delicious entrees and all of the fixings that come with it. According to QSR, KFC ranked number nine on a list of the top quick serve and fast casual brands in the nation. And fans can't seem to get enough of its savory fried chicken. Its blend of 11 herbs and spices and the preparation that combines sweet and salty in every bite leads fans of the franchise to believe it is damn near perfect. On top of the chicken, KFC has some very popular sides, which quite often end up on those ranked lists you find all over the internet. You might notice that the potatoes don't exactly look aesthetic. However, you'll be surprised to find they are actually packed with buttery flavor. And the gravy has a lot more pepper flavor than you'd ever expect. Naturally, that might lead one to ponder, how exactly are KFC's mashed potatoes made? An employee spilled the beans, er, potatoes. A TikTok video allegedly shows an employee explaining exactly what goes into the mashed potatoes, and it turns out the recipe is very simple, filling a metal container with three quarts of hot water, adding a packet of KFC one-step mashed potato mix. Stir it up, and after a bit of a waiting game, they are good to go. Yep, you heard that right, they are made from a powdered mix. A Redditor and KFC manager also confirmed the story, revealing quite bluntly that the potato is powdered instant potato. So the next time you're thinking of dropping by KFC, but don't want to make the drive, just remember you may not be able to match their masterful fried chicken, but you can always try your hands at their mashed potato method. While the KFC manager backed up the video as the real way the chain's mashed potatoes are made, other Redditors that have worked at KFC disagreed. They thought the method was far from a true representation of how the mashed potatoes are actually made. Instead, the locations they worked at in the past apparently did not take the extra time or steps to ensure the mashed potatoes would have a completely smooth gravy. One fellow former KFC employee responded, saying, Not one single time did anyone ever strain the gravy. The gravy is from a powder. Another former KFC cook wrote, Y'all strained your gravy? I whisked that f***ing bag of Insta gravy so hard. We never got all the lumps out, but there were never any lumps in the hot pans. Perhaps other chain locations were cutting corners, or maybe the one store that strains their gravy has simply gone rogue. Customers and fans may never know. But for the really good mashed potatoes, you might have to find out the specific location of that store. There's also a way to replicate the KFC gravy from the comfort of your own home. As long as you have instant potatoes, you can simply add in some butter to get a similar KFC base. But that's the easy part. If you really want something close to the real thing, you'll need to make the copycat gravy recipe that's been shared online. Here, we'll just save you the effort. All you need to make Kentucky Fried Chicken-style mashed potato gravy is butter, onion, flour, and water. You'll also need a couple of other ingredients to pack in the flavors you know and love. Try using beef bouillon or chicken bouillon, along with plenty of black pepper to get that mild heat to come through. With this copycat recipe in your repertoire, you'll be able to have KFC gravy anytime you want. Besides, if you make your own Kentucky Fried Chicken-style mashed potatoes and gravy at home, you can always customize the flavor a bit more. Not to mention you'll also be able to strain the gravy to make it ultra smooth if you really want to as well. For those who love potatoes, there's nothing more satisfying than one sliced to perfection and served as a french fry. Now imagine those crispy, thin-cut potatoes, but even better. Is that even possible? According to Chick-fil-A, the answer is yes, and they're called waffle fries. The A in Chick-fil-A stands for Grade A Quality. That means that the Atlanta-based restaurant wants nothing less than perfection in the food each location serves to its customers daily. This is especially important for waffle fries, the number one selling item on the menu. Producing a mouth-watering waffle fry means not settling for mediocre potatoes. That's why Chick-fil-A sources all of its spuds from the states of Washington and Oregon, particularly from farms down in the Columbia River Basin, where they care just as much about Chick-fil-A's customers as the restaurant itself. Chick-fil-A takes great care 
in choosing its suppliers, ensuring they follow very strict quality and safety standards. Creating the country's best quality potatoes doesn't come easy. From watering the land, tending the soil, all the way through digging, so much care goes into growing the spud that will one day become a Chick-fil-A waffle fry. It's just rewarding to know that we did our part and that's going to put food in someone's belly uh, down the road. What is it about the soil in the Columbia River Basin that makes it such an ideal place to grow potatoes? The answer, it turns out, is none other than volcanic ash. One of the most notable American volcanoes is southwest Washington's Mount St. Helens, which had a major eruption in 1980. This eruption disintegrated more than 230 square miles and spewed over 540 million tons of ash. To put that into perspective, a midsize SUV weighs about two tons. After the eruption, mineral and nutrient deposits that were in the rock of Mount St. Helens were then deposited within the surrounding basin. When ash is periodically added into existing soil, it actually improves soil quality, maintains moisture, and helps with productivity. It's crazy to think that such devastation can provide any benefit, but in the case of potatoes and the waffle fries they eventually become, it can. There's something unique about Chick-fil-A's waffle fries. You probably don't notice it with your first bite, as you're probably distracted by the crispy outside texture and large surface area that can hold a records amount of gourmet dipping sauces. But by the time you get to the end, you'll see it. Those last few pieces in your waffle fry order are missing something. The holes. But why would Chick-fil-A put you through that kind of torture and turn something so beautiful into something that looks like an unbaked potato chip on one side? According to the chain, the answer is simple. It's because they use real potatoes, and since no two potatoes are the same, you might end up with a few of what they call potato skin fries. Some customers may find it hard to grasp, but the no-hole potato skin fry is a Chick-fil-A staple. It comes with the territory. So, the next time you order up a side of waffle fries, know that you'll most likely come across a fry butt or two. Timing is everything when it comes to the perfection of Chick-fil-A's waffle fries. If you've ever burned a piece of toast or pulled chicken off the grill a little too early, you know that being a little off on the timing can mean disaster. How do you want that cooked? Run to a crisp or bloody as hell? For a restaurant that serves hundreds of bags of waffle fries a day, consistency is important. Luckily, Chick-fil-A has the cooking of its most popular item down to a science. Once the frozen fries are poured into the fry basket, they're then lowered into the fryer. At this point, the fry cook only has to press the waffle fry button on the machine to get the process started. The button is set to cook for two minutes. It's really that simple. After those two minutes, the fries are pulled from the fryer crisp, golden, and ready to be seasoned. Chick-fil-A founder S. Truett Cathy said, Food is essential to life, therefore make it good. There's no doubt that Chick-fil-A waffle fries are good, but it might surprise you to know how simple they actually are. There are just two main ingredients Chick-fil-A uses to bring out that monumental flavor of these crispy on the outside and tender on the inside treats. Waffle fries are poured into a fry basket and dipped in canola oil when cooking. Once the timer goes off, the fries are shaken of all excess oil. After the oil and before the serving comes one final ingredient a touch of salt. Chick-fil-A uses two pumps of sea salt from its special salt shaker to sprinkle over the waffle fries. Then the fries are tossed around with that perfect amount of salt to bring out the real potato flavor in each bite. Aside from the canola oil and the salt, there are a few chemical compounds for color retention and anti-foaming, but that's pretty minimal compared to other fast food fries. While most everything the Costco food court sells is utterly delicious, it's their pizza that's tops. Starting from an unassuming ball of dough, adding in a few handy robots, and ending with that ginormous finished product, here's exactly how Costco pizza is made. Good dough is the foundation of any great pizza, which is why Costco puts so much effort into every detail of their dough. First, they purchase the dough from a Brooklyn-based pizza distributor who delivers the authentic New York-style dough fresh daily. Then, Costco employees utilize a special dough squishing contraption to flatten the dough ball into a perfectly shaped crust. And finally, workers go over the dough with a unique tool called a dough docker, which pops any air bubbles in the dough to ensure it bakes evenly. No wonder the crust is so delicious.
After all that care they put into crafting the pizza, you just know Costco is going to use a special pan, too. Costco uses pizza pans with holes, otherwise known as perforated pans, and these holes allow the crust to bake up crispier, thanks to two things. One, rather than solid metal grabbing all the heat, the holes ensure that it transfers directly to the crust. Two, the holes allow moisture to escape out the bottom rather than sog up the crust and lets the entire thing cook evenly. Plus, as an added bonus, pizzas baked on perforated pans cook faster. And when the pizza is this good, who wants to wait? Costco doesn't just use special pans, though. They also use robots. We know what you're thinking. Robots? What the f does that have to do with pizza? But it's true. Once the pizza dough is squished and docked, the prepared pan gets placed onto a special sauce robot. At the push of a button, the contraption spins the pan around and spits out sauce in a very precise stream as its arm moves towards the center of the pie. The result is a kind of spin art effect on the dough, and while it's mesmerizing to watch, the reality is that the robot not only ensures that just the right amount of sauce is on each and every pizza, it also ensures that the right amount of sauce is equally distributed. Sure, it will inevitably lead to humanity's doom, but that's a small price to pay for good pizza. If you've ever ordered a whole Costco pie, you've probably noticed it can be a bit oily. But there's no oil robot to blame. Instead, according to one Reddit expert, Costco instructs employees to use a lot. The only thing that concerns me is how much oil gets used in the process of making a pizza skin, the stretched out and sauced pizza dough, too much. And when you don't use the corporate requested amount because you think it's too much and corporate notices, you use more oil to avoid being in trouble. Some managers overcompensate and use a quarter cup of oil plus when making them. This whole damn thing was about oil. Now that we've got the crust and the sauce, and some oil, it's time for the good stuff the toppings, and Costco doesn't skim. If you order the combo, you'll get Italian sausage, pepperoni, and a medley of sliced green bell peppers, red onions, mushrooms, and black olives. And a lot of each. A whole combo pizza weighs in at an incredible 4.49 pounds. Then there's the pepperoni, which gets decked out with 60 slices of pepperoni per pie. And the cheese, made with a combination of low-fat mozzarella, provolone, and 10-month-aged shredded parmesan, a single cheese pizza includes a whopping one and a half pounds of cheese alone. Wow. One thing you never have to worry about when you grab a slice from the Costco food court is that you're going to be cheated on the portion. And that's because the food court employees use a handy-dandy cutting guide that ensures every slice is exactly the same. Considering each pie is absolutely massive, you know that after the cutting is done, you're also going to be getting a massive slice, one-sixth of an 18-inch pizza to be exact. Just more proof that Costco has every aspect of the pizza-making process down, even something as simple as how best to cut it. With all those gadgets and doodads, Costco has their pizza making down to a science. Starting with a ball of dough, employees can make the crust, sauce it, and add the toppings all in about 75 seconds flat. And even the oven has been optimized for performance, with conveyors zipping pizzas through at just the perfect temperature. All told, from start to finish, a Costco pizza takes under 8 minutes to make. And that's part of why their pizzas are always fresh. One Reddit expert revealed that the company never serves leftovers, saying, Everything left over is tossed after we rolled the door at night and made fresh in the morning. And during the day, one Costco supervisor wrote on Quora, Any pizza slice that doesn't sell within the hour gets thrown out and replaced to maintain freshness. Great pizza made at light speed by robots? Turns out we're living in the future right now. And it's delicious. Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. These are the ingredients that make up McDonald's legendary Big Mac. The brainchild of franchisee Jim Delegati, the double-decker cheeseburger was first sold at a Pennsylvania McDonald's in 1967, and it remains a classic McDonald's menu staple today. When we say the Big Mac is popular, we're not just parroting McDonald's talking points, either. In 2007, it was estimated that the chain sold 550 million Big Macs in the United States alone, according to a report from USA Today. Mondays, I always eat one Big Mac, two on Tuesdays, one on Wednesdays, two on Thursdays, one or two on Friday, and two every Saturday. There's even a museum dedicated to the burger in North Huntington, Pennsylvania, where you and your family can delight in the history of the sandwich over, what else, a Big Mac and some fries. No matter how you eat it, whether it's alongside some piping hot fries or by itself in all its glory, there's no denying a Big Mac is an iconic meal. But for all of its fame, do you really know how this iconic sandwich is assembled? 
One self-identified McDonald's employee has shared all the secrets on TikTok, and Big Mac fans are mesmerized by the process. According to TikTok user Essential McDonald's, the process of making a Big Mac is more complex than you might be expecting, but the assembly still takes place entirely in the box the sandwich comes in. First, the three buns, the top crown, the bottom heel, and the middle club, are toasted in separate toasters. Then, three dollops of Big Mac sauce are added to the heel and club parts of the buns using a specialized condiment gun, followed by a sprinkling of chopped onions, shredded lettuce, and thinly sliced pickles. All of that is followed by a slice of American cheese. Then, the two beef patties, the most integral part of the Big Mac, are placed onto the heel and the club. The most challenging part, according to the TikTok creator, is that the middle part of the Big Mac must be lifted onto the bottom part before the bun is added on top to complete the burger. Of course, TikTok was loving it when they got to see the inside secrets behind one of McDonald's most prized items. One commenter asked, Did I just get trained to work in a McDonald's? Meanwhile, another joked about the missing final step in the process, writing, You forgot to shake the box about, so everything is all over the place when I open it. Other TikTok users commented on how they're obsessed with the inside deets on how McDonald's is made, even people who say they themselves work at other McDonald's locations. And people aren't just curious about how to make a Big Mac. While the Big Mac has undoubtedly earned its place in the fast food history books, the iconic sandwich is also a common item on the menu. The McRib, on the other hand, is something fans mark their calendars for. This saucy, savory sandwich always stirs up fanfare when rumblings about its return start to spread across the internet. But for as popular as it is, just how exactly is the legendary sandwich made? There are some pretty nasty rumors about the McRib floating around. Naturally, Savvy calls it, quote, grade F mystery meat. And according to the New York Daily News, the Humane Society has even accused McRib meat supplier Smithfield Foods of animal cruelty. To dispel some of the rumors about how the fan favorite sandwich is made, McDonald's took viewers on a journey inside one of its factories, showcasing the McRib process from beginning to end. The process begins with boneless pork shoulder that is ground into rough, pebbly piles of pork. Salt, dextrose, and preservatives for locking the flavor inside the meat are added before it is mechanically shaped to resemble the famed McRib patty. The patty is then flash-frozen before being cooked in McDonald's own specially made barbecue sauce. To finish it all off, the freshly cooked patty is added to a toasted bun, topped with pickles and onions, and then enjoyed fresh off the line. It may not be the prettiest sight, but McDonald's assures fans that there's nothing funky going on with the McRib behind the scenes. Kentucky Fried Chicken has been known for its buckets of fried chicken since opening its first franchise location in 1952. But since it began selling pot pies in 1995, they have arguably become just as much of a staple on the menu. Originally introduced as a limited edition item in a select part of the country, KFC's pot pies didn't seem like they were destined to take off. However, the fast food chain decided to officially add them to its regular menu. Marketing the pot pie as nostalgic comfort food played a major role in its long-term success. Join me now for a journey into the comfort zone. The comfort zone. By continuing to use retro themes, imagery and music in commercials, KFC managed to turn an old-fashioned favourite into a trendy throwback. If you're a pot pie fan, you may have wondered what makes them so good and, perhaps more importantly, what goes into making them at all. A video by a KFC employee apparently revealed how they're made. The YouTube description for KFC's fresh versus classic commercial boasts that KFC's pot pie is as fresh as it is classic. But footage by one KFC employee suggests otherwise. A now-deleted TikTok video posted by Modacious shows a batch of the restaurant's signature pot pies being made. It begins with a tub of white powder that forms gravy when combined with water. The employee then whisks in a bag of veggies and tops the mixture off with cooked chicken from two separate Ziploc bags. Modacious doesn't speak in the video, but one self-identified former manager commenting on a Reddit AMA said, Pot pies are made with chicken leftovers after close. The chicken is deboned and shredded by hand. The chicken is separated into bags. It might sound less than appealing to use leftover chicken in a freshly baked pot pie, but this method happens to be how they are traditionally made. Chicken pot pies have contained leftover meat for centuries, so while KFC's offering may not be entirely fresh in the classic sense of the word, the recipe sounds pretty close to authentic. The fact that KFC's pot pies are made with leftover chicken doesn't mean that they sit in the back of the refrigerator for eons until someone decides to order one. 
One former KFC manager on Reddit said that while the leftover chicken might be shredded, bagged and stored after closing time, the pot pies themselves are actually prepared as needed throughout the day. So although the KFC employee in the viral TikTok video appears to be preparing quite a few pot pies at once, it might not reflect how freshly baked they actually are when served to customers. As the manager on Reddit explained, we take a pie tin, scoop a mix of sauce and vegetables, add chicken, and put a flat frozen top on it. This, of course, isn't nearly as fresh as making it at home from scratch, but at least you know the KFC pot pies aren't just being reheated after long stints in the freezer. And let's not forget, this is fast food we're talking about. So if you want pot pie in the time it takes to wait in line at the drive through this is probably as good as it's going to get. On the plus side, KFC pot pies reduce food waste, which is something the company seems to care a fair deal about. In a 2020 press release on its website, KFC affirmed its commitment to keeping perfectly edible chicken from being needlessly tossed out. And KFC Italia spent years encouraging customers to take home their uneaten chicken for later. Parent company Yum Brands revealed that unused chicken is also donated to hunger relief organizations throughout the US. That effort is an extension of KFC's food donation program called Harvest, which began combating food insecurity in 1999. Since then, KFC has donated over 83 million pounds of chicken. Of course, quality control means some chicken can't be donated or turned into pot pie filling. As another KFC manager explained in a Reddit AMA, we have holding times on everything, so if it's not sold within a specific time, it's thrown. Though not all the food can be saved, KFC seemingly does everything in its power to prevent waste. Making pot pies with leftover chicken, therefore, isn't just the restaurant being cheap or trying to get away with stretching its products for as long as possible. So even if you're not a fan of the upcycling involved in KFC's pot pie recipe, there's no denying that it aids in a worthy cause. Papa John's has undergone some major changes in the last few years, but the powers that be keep telling us the pizza has stayed the same. Welcome to Papa's house. Today is an exciting day in the history of Papa John's. It's an exciting day because we're going to be breaking down the burning question that's been on everyone's mind. How does Papa John's make such good pizza? Here's your answer. To make a good pizza, you gotta start with a good base. And if you're wondering what goes into Papa John's base, look no further than the official website. That's where all the ingredients are listed, and what a distinguished and delicious list it is. Hungry? Feed your imagination. Feed your anticipation. If you're ordering a traditional hand-tossed Papa John's pizza, the crust consists of some really rather basic ingredients. Unbleached enriched wheat flour, water, sugar, soybean oil, salt, and yeast. One supposed Papa John's employee told Pizza Recipes 101, you must let the dough proof until it's about three inches thick. Then you must roll it with a roller with studs on. That will give you the texture of the pizza. When making the crust, you use all your fingers except pointers and thumbs and press into the border of the dough about one fourth inch for the thickness of the pizza crust. You must do this before slapping the pizza. Thanks for clearing that up. Now that's serious pizza. Having a good crust is just the beginning. If you want to make a truly superior pizza pie, you're going to need a truly kick-ass tomato sauce. And Papa John's knows it. We're fanatics about quality. Nobody does, but Papa John's does. The company website handily breaks down the ingredients for you. Fresh vine-ripened tomatoes from a can, salt, garlic, spices, oils, and sugar. Oh, and a word of warning, the sauce might contain a lot of sugar. That is, if a former manager on Reddit can be believed. Another alleged Papa John's employee told Pizza Recipes 101 that you should spread the tomato sauce to one inch from the border of the pizza. So now you know. When you're making a pizza, you gotta use the right cheese. Crispy, crunchy, cheesy. Papa John's new pan pizza. Turns out Papa John's choice in cheese is rather similar to that of its competitors. 
And as a Papa John's customer, you regularly have two tasty choices to choose from. A blend of Parmesan and Romano, or a most delicious three-cheese blend. The latter consists of provolone, fontina, and Asiago cheeses. According to Forbes, Papa John's cheeses are provided by Leprino Foods, the same company that supplies cheese to Domino's, Little Caesars, and Pizza Hut. However, each chain uses their own unique blend of cheeses, and that's one of many reasons these pizzas all taste different. In 2016, Papa John's launched a new pizza, the Pan Pizza. That's a Papa John's Pan Pizza with up to five toppings or specialty, only $10. Papa John's chief ingredient officer told Business Insider that it took a year and a half to perfect the pan pizza, which is made using a different process than the chain's other offerings. The dough has only seven ingredients. It's rolled out with a spiky docker to get rid of any potential bubbles, and then it's put in a pan instead of being hand-tossed. After that, sauce, toppings, and cheese are added. The cheese is spread all the way to the crust for that perfect cheese ring you crave so very, very much. Pan pizza isn't made in the same oven as hand-tossed or thin-crust pizza, so restaurants have to add special equipment to their kitchen or have two different ovens. Now let's talk about the outer edge of Papa John's pan pizza. Business Insider dutifully reported that there's less crust and more of a caramelized crisp. Oh, we are so very there. Papa John's slogan is certainly no secret. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. But word to the wise, some of those so-called better ingredients might not be quite so fresh. According to a former manager writing on Reddit, Papa John's has a spinach Alfredo sauce that's delicious but only gets ordered maybe once a week. And it hits its sell-by date three days after you open the bag, but no one actually throws it out until it's either gone or nasty-looking. Apparently, the toppings suffer from a similar problem. Writing on Reddit, a supposed employee claims that so few people order anchovies that the leftover is sometimes forgotten and will still end up on a pizza. This tattletale employee also described a chicken topping that comes to the stores in a bag that has a strong chemical odor. Hmm, maybe we'll just order a cheese pizza next time. What makes Papa John's pizza so very, very special? There are theories. A lot of people would say it's all those unique extras you get. You might be most familiar with the chain's garlic sauce, but it's hardly the only sauce available at Papa John's. Other dipping sauces include ranch, buffalo, and barbecue. You can also add extra pepperoncini or get packets of crushed red pepper or Parmesan cheese. And talk about unique, the garlic sauce, by far Papa John's most popular extra, had a limited edition one-gallon jug release in 2018. Yes, it's so good that fans bought it by the gallon. Sounds like some Papa John aficionados really know how to keep it classy. Our kind of people. Whether you love it or hate it, you know that iconic blue box when you see it on the store shelf. Chances are you've eaten it more times than you can count. What's not to love? That leaves us with one question. How is this magical macaroni and cheese made? When Kraft Mac and Cheese made its debut around World War II, it was an instant hit. But before this revolutionary boxed meal came an even bigger innovation from J.L. Kraft, the man behind the Kraft Foods empire. In 1916, Kraft was awarded the first patent ever for creating processed cheese, which is basically a method for making a cheese product that is shelf-stable and won't spoil quickly. We won't get into the chemistry of it all, but it is safe to say that the processed cheese fundamentally changed the ways we eat. After Kraft's process processed cheese became a hit, the company wanted to expand to feed the masses. Processed cheese led to the invention of powdered cheese, and eventually the boxed mac and cheese dinner was born. This was right around the Great Depression and World War II, so the cheap, easy, and yet elevated meal became a staple in many American households. House Book Club It must be hard to discuss literature with your mouth full of my Kraft mac and cheese. As counterintuitive as it may seem, the bright orange processed cheese powder that brings Kraft macaroni and cheese to life actually begins more like the cheese sauce it will become. And it all starts with real cheese. This cheese sauce gets a small amount of sodium phosphate added to it, which is the magic ingredient that helps bind the oil and water in cheese so that it stays smooth and creamy when it melts. At this point, the cheese is resembling something more like the Velveeta shells and cheese sauce we know and love. So how does it go from this to powder? 
The final step in going from cheese to cheese powder involves a process far older than Kraft macaroni and cheese itself, food dehydration. The natural version of the process has been used by indigenous Americans and some Eastern cultures for generations. Food dehydration dates back to the late 18th century. The main function of dehydrating food, either naturally using heat or more modern chemical processes, is to make it essentially non-perishable. Today, it's so common that you can buy food dehydrators on Amazon for less than $45, and that's basically what Kraft uses, only smaller. Kraft macaroni and cheese can be identified in part by the distinct yellowish-orange color of its processed product. For a long time, that signature color came from the addition of synthetic food dyes, but that is not the case anymore. In 2015, thanks to growing consumer demand for more natural foods, Kraft announced that it was changing up the way it makes its famous macaroni and cheese. Going forward, the company eliminated the use of all artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives in its whole line of products, including the boxed mac and cheese. When Kraft removed these synthetic dyes from its boxed mac and cheese, it had to add something in its place to make sure the product still looked and tasted the same for consumers. Today, Kraft macaroni and cheese is made with a blend of spices that help achieve that goal. They include bright red paprika, which is infused into the noodles as well as used in the cheese sauce, rich yellow turmeric, which contains a host of health benefits in addition to the perfect mac and cheese hue, is also included. According to Eater, Kraft massaged their new mac and cheese formula for over three years before they got it just right. And while there were a small number of mac and cheese lovers who petitioned Kraft to go back to their original recipe, most people embraced the changes. While no one is trying to claim that Kraft macaroni and cheese is a good substitute for a salad, the blue box is actually full of more nutrients than you might think. One box of Kraft mac and cheese contains about three servings, and each serving contains a whopping 9 grams of protein. On top of that, Kraft mac and cheese is a great source of calcium and iron, with 10% of your recommended daily value of each in a serving. And having a little mac and cheese with kids won't be a diet breaker either. There are just 3 grams of fat per serving and no trans fats. Heck, have the whole box without feeling guilty. The only kicker is the sodium. With 570 milligrams in each serving, you're looking at almost a quarter of your daily recommended intake right there. <laughs> Tell me about Mac's famous mac and cheese. We know that Kraft macaroni and cheese does in fact contain real cheese, but it's a processed powdered cheese, so it's worth clarifying what that means for allergies and dietary restrictions. First of all, this may be surprising, but Kraft mac and cheese is not technically considered vegetarian. That's because, per a FAQ on Kraft's corporate website, during the process of converting milk into cheese, enzymes from animal sources are used. So, those who choose not to consume animal products should be aware of this when deciding whether they want to eat this mac and cheese. Additionally, anyone with with intolerance to gluten may need to evaluate if they can eat Kraft mac and cheese. On the box's ingredients list, it clearly states that the product contains wheat and milk. There is some good news for some. Kraft does offer a gluten-free version of its boxed mac and cheese. What started out as a single box of macaroni and cheese has grown into an empire. Kraft has expanded way beyond its original recipe and now offers dozens of Kraft mac and cheese products in a variety of flavors from three cheese to white cheddar. Kraft relies on a variety of its patented cheese powders to create these flavors, and Kraft keeps coming up with more. The company is always trying out new limited edition flavors. One of their most recent concoctions is Candy Kraft mac and cheese. If you're not sure how you feel about it, you're not alone. Let's just say some work out better than others. Have you ever wondered what type of meat Wendy's uses in its chili? For instance, does the hamburger chain use fresh meat to make its chili? Or are old hamburger patties used in the chunky stew? You'll want to keep watching to find out. There was a time when the biggest question associated with Wendy's was, Where's the beef? In those carefree days of 1984, Wendy's did the asking. That question became a rhetorical smackdown that casts doubt on how well-grounded an idea is. But in more recent years, people have had a beef with Wendy's ground meat. There's no need to ask where it is because it's in the chain's chili. Instead, people find the meat itself questionable. Back in 2015, people asked if Wendy's even used beef in its chili. As Snopes explained, Explained, a satirical piece by News Buzz Daily gave people the false impression the meat wasn't holy cow, but what sounds like an unholy trinity of horse, rat, and beef. Nowadays, chili detractors who accept that the meat comes entirely from animals that moo may still claim that Wendy's milks its cow meat for too long, using beef patties that are well past their prime. 
TikToker Mr. Mobby described them as, quote, old dry patties in a TikTok video that amassed more than 7 million views and 19,000 comments before it was removed from the site, the TikToker claims to be, quote, exposing Wendy's. Set in a kitchen, the video showed beef patties being rinsed, microwaved, chopped into chunks, and placed in a bag for safekeeping until they can fill chili cups. According to the TikToker, the meat was then stored in a refrigerator for a few days. Despite featuring the text How Wendy's Prepares Chili, the since-deleted TikTok video doesn't actually show the chili being prepared in its entirety and stops after the ground beef is stored. But maybe Mr. Mobby got it wrong. User Kendall seemed to think the claims were more bull than beef, writing, I used to work at Wendy's. The only correct part of this was the chopping with a spatula. Another self-described Wendy's employee claimed that their location used fresh patties to prepare chili. A 2021 Reddit thread also addressed the question of whether the hamburger chain uses old meat in its chili. The thread featured self-identified Wendy's employees who revealed that broken patty pieces that may have been cooked too long were used in the chili. Moreover, some in insisted the meat was just as fresh as the beef used in sandwiches. Regardless of how Wendy's chili is prepared, it's still an incredibly popular menu item. And for some fans, the way it's made simply isn't a problem. According to The Daily Dot, a former employee who worked at Wendy's in 1998 claimed nothing had changed about the process. In a 2020 YouTube video, Mashed asked viewers what they think about Wendy's chili, and the comments were mostly in favor of the meaty dish. One YouTuber wrote, I like the chili and never regretted a single serving I've had. Another YouTuber also had nothing but positive things to say about Wendy's chili, writing, "...one bowl of their chili makes one killer meal." In fact, Wendy's chili has so many fans, diners are looking to replicate the dish at home. A simple Google search will yield dozens of recipes. Wendy's isn't the only establishment that's come under fire for its recipes, preparation techniques, and ingredients, and the response is often as divided as the Wendy's chili discussion. TikToker Isaiah Gilly, presumably a McDonald's employee, regularly posts videos showing the preparation of popular menu items, including a viral video depicting the construction of the ever-popular McRib. Gilly's videos often receive mixed responses in the comments, with some users claiming they're grossed out by the processes, and others stating they'll continue to eat at McDonald's. And it's not just customers who are split when it comes to whether or not fast food procedures are indeed gross, it's also employees. A Reddit thread explores items customers may want to avoid at popular restaurants. One user claiming to be a Dunkin' employee told customers to avoid the eggs, stating they'd witnessed eggs left out for more than three hours. However, no matter how you fry it, fast food and its controversial menu items, like the Wendy's Chili, are here to stay. What exactly is Jell-O made of? Does it really contain horses' hooves? And what is in a Jell-O salad? From its long-reaching history to its key ingredients, this is how Jell-O is really made. The key ingredient in Jell-O is gelatin. Of course, you've probably heard of this stuff before, and you might have heard some pretty gruesome rumors about it, too. So what is it? Put short, it's a flavorless, colorless ingredient derived from animal collagen. Gelatin occurs naturally in the meat, bones, and cartilage of various animals and is the reason that meaty soups or broths begin to solidify after they're chilled for long enough. Generally, the collagens from which gelatin is derived comes from an animal's skin, tendons, ligaments, and bones. This is why vegans and members of certain religions are unable to eat jello and other foods that include gelatin. During the manufacturing process, these connective tissues are boiled, dried, treated with acid, and filtered out in order to extract the collagen. This is then dried and ground up into a powder. This powder can be added to liquids to give them the jiggly characteristic for which Jell-O is so well known, but only if it's done right. And even then, it can be difficult to exactly describe what it's like to eat it. Jiggly and squishy. I don't know, like weird kind of. And it feels good in your mouth. The science works like this. When you dissolve powdered gelatin in cold water, the granule gelatins become hydrated. When you add that mixture to a warm liquid, the collagen molecules begin to stretch and loosen. Then, when you put the mixture into the fridge, those fully hydrated gelatin molecules rebond, turning the liquid into jello. Just like magic, ain't it? Another of the key ingredients in Jell-O is sweetener, usually aspartame, a type of artificial calorie-free sweetener, but also sometimes sugar. Jell-O also contains artificial flavors. How else do you think they get it tasting so good? Then you've got your food colorings. These days, Jell-O has a few products made from natural ingredients. Most types of Jell-O, however, are still made with artificial food dyes. Put all this together and you've got a surprisingly hefty ingredient list. 
Take strawberry jello, for example. This kind of jello contains not just gelatin, but also sugar, adipic acid, artificial flavor, disodium phosphate, sodium citrate, fumaric acid, and red dye number 40. Meanwhile, sugar free peach jello contains those same ingredients, only with aspartame instead of sugar and a slightly different dye. We've all heard the relatively common rumor that Jell-O contains horses' hooves. But is it true? In a word? Nope. The root of this rumor is obvious, of course. Gelatin is made from collagen, and that's derived from connective tissues in animal meats, meaning you would be right to say that Jell-O contains the bones and skin of animals. What's crucial to know here is that, first of all, gelatin doesn't tend to be made from horse. Usually, it's the connective tissue of cows and pigs that are used in the manufacturing process. Presumably, this is because cows and pigs are far more regularly farmed and slaughtered than horses, so their skin and bones are easier to get hold of. There's also the fact that the hoof of an animal doesn't actually contain gelatin at all. Instead, the hoof is made from keratin, another kind of protein that can also be found in turtle shells and human fingernails. This protein can be used to similar effect as gelatin, but trust us, you won't find it in your jello. You wouldn't imagine many people consider Jell-O to be a particularly healthy food, and it's safe to say that there's no surprise in store here. It's not. While Jell-O is low in calories and fat-free, that doesn't make it good for you. One serving of Jell-O tends to contain around 80 calories, 1.6 grams of protein, and 18 grams of sugar. Even the sugar-free variants aren't great. One serving of sugar-free Jell-O usually contains 13 calories, 1 gram of protein, and no sugar, but artificial sweeteners can still have adverse effects on your health. Beyond the sugar content, however, it's important to realize that Jell-O contains practically zero nutrients. That means you're not getting any vitamins or minerals out of it. Considering it's also low in protein and fiber, it's hard to make much of an argument for Jell-O as a health food. Now, there's literally zero chance you've gotten this far and not wondered whether Jell-O can be made from humans. And good news? It sure can. In 2011, Popular Science reported that scientists are developing a new way for producing gelatin derived from humans, in large enough quantities to be able to replace the animal-based gelatins currently used in the food, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic industries. To create this kind of gelatin, the outlet reports human genes are inserted into yeast strains that are tuned to produce gelatin in specific controlled ways. Obviously, there's an environmental aspect to this, but that wasn't the only reason this research began. Because gelatin is derived from animals, it actually has a very slight risk of provoking immune symptom responses in humans or carrying infectious diseases. These scientists believe these problems might actually be solved by creating gelatin from humans. But this new kind of gelatin also throws up an interesting conundrum. Is it vegetarian, or is it actually a very weird kind of ethical cannibalism? Although human gelatin hasn't quite reached the commercial phase of its development, you may yet see it hit stores in the coming years. A number of different ingredients can be used to make vegan gelatin. The first is agar-agar. Like gelatin, this seaweed extract is flavorless, odorless, and colorless, and handily comes in a powdered form. It's this kind of agar-agar that can be substituted for gelatin on a one-to-one -one ratio. Then there's pectin, which is made from fruit skins and rinds, and it's most commonly used to thicken jams, jellies, and marmalades. To get it to gel properly, you'll need to add some sugar. Add 5 cups of sugar to each pack of powdered pectin, or 3 to 4 cups to each pouch of liquid pectin. Throw in a little lemon juice for acidity, and you've got your gelatin substitute ready to go. You could also try carrageenan, or vegetable gums. Just be aware that these come with their own issues. Carrageenan has been linked to gastrointestinal problems, while some people find it difficult to digest certain vegetable gums. One of the best things about Jell-O is that it can come in pretty much any flavor. Some of the most popular Jell-O flavors to have hit stores over the years include strawberry, orange, cherry, watermelon, and mango. Occasionally, mainstream Jell-O desserts have pushed the boat out a little further, with flavors such as apricot, fruit punch, berry blue, and tropical fusion. But they're not that weird, are they? Well, over the years, Jell-O has introduced and discontinued a range of seriously weird flavors, too. There's celery, for one, if you're the kind of person who prefers their jello salty and watery. Or how about Italian salad, for when you just have to jelly your leftover tomatoes and mozzarella. There was also a coffee-flavored jello, which bombed in the U.S. but was a big hit in Japan. Jello also made pistachio, cola, cotton candy, and maple syrup jellos. Because why not? One of the truly iconic uses for jello is the jello salad. 
According to author Laura Shapiro, during the early 20th century, quote, nothing so quickly identified a meal as upscale, glamorous, and artistic as a magnificent salad. The invention of Jell-O and its rising popularity in America gave homemakers the opportunity to showcase their magnificent, fancy salads in an even more exciting way. These jellied salads became so popular because, well, they weren't salads, as Shapiro stated. You ate dessert and called it salad. It was supremely sweet, which was the goal of an enormous amount of American cooking and eating. By the mid-70s, it was practically impossible to attend an American dinner party, picnic, or potluck that didn't feature at least one jello salad. Unfortunately, not all of them were tasty, with food writer Wendy Tian saying, Savory jello salad led me to perfect the art of pretending to take a hearty bite and disposing of it in a napkin. Ah, uh, jello shots, the backbone of partying in the Western world, the bane of many a college freshman, the gelatinous, delicious concoction that can only be described as simultaneously one of the best and worst ideas ever devised by humankind. One of the biggest problems people tend to have with jello shots is that they get drunk off them way too fast. That's because when you ingest alcohol in a solid form, it doesn't dissolve on your tongue quite as much as a liquid might, meaning you taste it less. Obviously, that means trouble. According to Serious Eats, a standard Jell-O shot recipe will usually call for 5 ounces of 80-proof vodka and 11 ounces of water. Unfortunately, this standard shot will end up tasting watered down, but a stronger shot might cause you a whole new world of bother. So how do you get them just right? Playing with texture can help. Using xanthan gum as a thickener rather than gelatin can often create a jellified outer coat and a liquid interior, giving you what essentially amounts to a small booze grenade that bursts open when you bite into it. You could also use corn syrup and egg white to give your alcoholic jellies a puffier texture, or try some new flavors by utilizing other alcohols and add-ins. Gelatin-like substances have been mentioned in historical records that date back as far as the Roman era, but gelatin as we know it shows up during the early 15th century. During this period, medieval cooks used the gelatin made from broths of boiled pig's ears and feet to make jellies. These jellies were enjoyed both for their strange texture and their ability to prevent spoilage of any meats and vegetables that were encased within them. When the Catholic Church later recommended their followers not consume meat on Fridays, medieval chefs developed fish jellies to cope, usually made from eels. At the end of the medieval era, however, sweet jellies were finally created, although many derived their texture from ingredients such as pectin rather than gelatin. In 1818, gelatin was manufactured industrially for the first time. By the mid-1800s, the first gelatin dessert mix had been patented by a New York industrialist and glue magnate named Peter Cooper. His powdered gelatin mix was made using processed lemons, sugar, eggs, and spices. Unfortunately for Cooper, his invention was eventually overshadowed by someone else's. In 1887, Pearl B. Waite created his own mix of gelatin, sugar, and food coloring. At his wife's suggestion, he named it Jell-O. In 1899, Pearl Waite sold his formula and patent for Jell-O for $450 to a businessman named Frank Woodward. Unfortunately, Jell-O didn't exactly take off. Despite an aggressive marketing campaign, sales lagged. Frustrated by his lack of success, Woodward offered the rights to Jell-O to the superintendent at his production plant for $35. That's around $1,000 today. Luckily, the superintendent refused, and in 1904, things turned around for Woodward. Using the money he had made from other products, he bought ads for Jell-O in Ladies' Home Journal, a nationally syndicated publication. Sales of Jell-O soared, and in just a few years, it had become one of America's most recognizable brands. Free Jell-O molds were even handed out to immigrants arriving at Ellis Island. Woodward didn't get to enjoy much of the success. He passed away in 1906. By 1924, Woodward's company had become the Jell-O Company. Over the next century, the product got stronger and stronger, thanks in large to the Jell-O Company's admirable marketing skills. Mm, there's nothing quite like Jell-O for entertaining. Everybody loves its jolly smile. So when's the Jell-O party? Tomorrow. We, we accept. accept. Catchy jingles, ingenious slogans, celebrity spokespeople, and the iconic Jell-O Girl all helped to sell the product to America. In 1964, an industrial conglomerate known as General Foods, today known as Kraft, took over the manufacturing of Jell-O's product. 
For die-hard bakers, Crisco has long been a pantry staple. While it's not the only vegetable shortening on the market, it's certainly the best known. But before you head to the store to stock up on all of the different Crisco products, you might want to know exactly how they're made. Crisco's 100-plus year history started as a story of marketing success. According to a history of the company published on Real Food Houston, Crisco was invented by Procter & Gamble and was officially introduced in 1911. William Procter and James Gamble started using hydrogenated cottonseed oil to make P&G soap, which gave them the idea to use this artificially solid oil product in the kitchen. And that's exactly what the original Crisco was — hydrogenated cottonseed oil. They were able to convince customers like train lines to use it in place of lard, and they recruited doctors and rabbis for product testimonials, saying it was a healthier and kosher product that could replace lard and butter in baking and frying. Butter is naturally solid at room temperature due to its saturated fats. Lard is the same, as are oils with a higher saturated fat content, like coconut oil. But other oils, like olive oil, grapeseed oil, sunflower seed oil, and soybean oil are all liquid all the time. An article on Healthline explains that their unsaturated fats lack the hydrogen molecule necessary to render them solid or semi-solid at room temperature. When hydrogen molecules are added to these oils during processing, they become solid or semi-solid at room temperature, making them more spreadable, as with Crisco or margarine. Procter & Gamble, with the help of a chemist, came up with this hydrogenation process in the early 1900s. And according to an article written by Megan Telpner, Crisco was the first ever food product to include these partially hydrogenated oils. So when the early Crisco ads touted the absolutely new product, they weren't lying. Have you ever heard of lettuce oil or cucumber oil? Of course not. As pointed out by nutritionist and founder of the Academy of Culinary Nutrition, Megan Telpner, oils are derived from grains like corn oil, fruits like avocado, olive, and coconut oils, and seeds like flaxseed oil. So why would Crisco claim to be vegetable oil and shortening on their packaging? It's not entirely clear, but it could be a sign of the times. In the early 1900s when the oil was introduced, there might have been less differentiation between types of plant-derived foods like grains and vegetables. Think about it, many people still think of corn and avocados as vegetables, right? So it may be as simple as semantics. The other possibility is a form of marketing that Teltner refers to as health washing. The idea is that if you put a health claim in big, bold letters on the front of food packaging, people may be more inclined to think the product is good for them and be more inclined to buy it. So, if early Crisco marketers were trying to influence people's perception of the fat as being a healthier option than butter or lard, using the words all vegetable shortening on the front of the packaging was a smart call. Cottonseed oil isn't commonly found on grocery store shelves, although as Healthline points out, it's often found in processed foods like cookies because it can extend shelf life. The article in Healthline also notes that in order to meet regulations for use as a food product, cottonseed oil has to go through refinement, bleaching, and deodorization to remove gossipol, a toxic compound. This toxic compound must be removed because it's been linked to infertility, pregnancy problems, liver damage, and respiratory distress. Unrefined cottonseed oil, the oil with gossipol, has even been used as a pesticide. In other words, it's not something you want to put in your body. When P&G developed their hydrogenation method to start making bar soap from liquid oils rather than lard, they also decided to put it into use in the kitchen. The Weston A. Price Foundation explains that because P&G was already using cottonseed oil for its soaps, it made sense to continue using this form of oil. Unfortunately for everyone who jumped on the hydrogenized oils as health products bandwagon, time and science started to uncover a nasty truth. Eating lots of hydrogenated oils isn't as good for you as Crisco and other companies would have you believe. In 2002, P&G sold Crisco to the J.M. Smucker Company, and the formula was changed in 2007, according to Fox News. It's great chicken. Mmm, no greasy, oily taste. 
At just about the same time as P&G was divesting itself of its 90-year-old Crisco brand, more and more evidence was building that the consumption of hydrogenated oils wasn't all that healthy. In fact, according to a 2012 NPR article on the history of Crisco, the qualities that made hydrogenation so appealing to companies and consumers — for instance, making liquid oil solid and spreadable, increasing shelf life, and enhancing baking and frying capabilities — all depended on the creation of trans fats. Initially, these fats were thought to be heart-healthier than saturated fats because they were a form of mono- and polyunsaturated fats rather than the saturated fats found in lard, butter, or coconut oil. But in the mid-1990s, studies started indicating that trans fats increased forms of artery-clogging cholesterol. An article in Healthline details that high consumption of trans fats can lead to increases in inflammation, impair blood sugar control, and harm heart health. Health. In 2015, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration started the process of removing artificial trans fats from processed foods. In response, Crisco changed its formula, and now the classic Crisco shortening is made of soybean oil, fully hydrogenated palm oil, and other additives. Numerous studies have found that trans fats are bad for heart health, and the FDA has effectively banned the addition of artificial trans fats to processed foods. Plus, Crisco is still available for purchase at grocery stores nationwide. So basic logic should determine that Crisco doesn't have trans fats, right? Especially since they put that there are zero grams of trans fats per serving right there on the can. Oh, if only you could trust food marketers. Or the FDA. As pointed out in an article published on NPR's website, the FDA allows foods that contain less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving to claim the food contains zero grams of this fat. And the FDA's own website states, It's important to note that trans fat will not be completely gone from foods because it occurs naturally in small amounts in meat and dairy products and is present at very low levels in other edible oils. Mom, this is delicious. Too delicious. This is fried in trans fat! So if Crisco can list zero grams of trans fats on its label, and the FDA admits there's this loophole for companies to do so, even if a product has small amounts of trans fats, how can you know if Crisco has trans fats? Look at the ingredients listed on Crisco's own website. It's clear that Crisco still uses hydrogenated oil as an ingredient, which is one of the surefire ways to know whether a product contains trace amounts of trans fats. One thing to keep in mind is that Crisco is a brand, not a single product. According to the Crisco website, what started out as a company featuring a single tub of vegetable shortening slowly expanded in the 1980s and 1990s, adding easy-to-measure vegetable shortening sticks followed by the addition of butter-flavored shortening. In 2002, even more products were added to the brand's lineup. These new additions included oils, sprays, and organic coconut oil, all designed to help Crisco hold on to its market share of baking oils. Crisco's line of vegetable shortening includes four total products — the Original Shortening, Original Shortening Packaged as Sticks, and Butter-Flavored Shortening, as well as Butter-Flavored Sticks. While the butter-flavored version has a slightly different list of ingredients than the original version, there are really only two different forms of shortening — original or butter-flavored. Both versions are made from soybean oil, fully hydrogenated palm oil, palm oil, mono and diglycerides, TBHQ, and citric acid. All in all, soybean oil and palm oil are types of vegetable oils that, when consumed in moderation, are unlikely to cause major harm. The the catch, of course, is consuming highly processed fats and hydrogenated fats, as this processing creates trans fats and can strip all other nutrients from these oils. Part of the reason you know these shortenings are processed is in the addition of mono and diglycerides, which help create a better texture for margarine. You should also be aware of the addition of TBHQ. A Healthline article notes that this additive helps extend shelf life, but it's highly controversial because it's been linked to health problems, like liver enlargement, increased incidence of tumors, convulsions, and paralysis in lab animals. 
Granted, the FDA limits how much can be used, and in the case of TBHQ, no more than 0.02% can be present in food. So, word to the wise, it's in Crisco. What are you doing? That's Crisco! Crisco's line of liquid oils is actually more extensive than its shortenings, with seven separate products. In general, products that are 100% vegetable oil are a better option than more processed fat products, like shortening. In the case of Crisco oils, consider the following. Crisco's 100% oils include pure canola oil, pure vegetable oil, pure corn oil, and its blends oil. While all of these are plant-derived fats, and most are considered good cooking oils, keep a few things in mind. First, according to an article on Healthline, most inexpensive vegetable oils are derived from genetically modified plants. Second, according to another Healthline article, because it requires a lot of processing to extract oil from these grains and seeds, they're more likely to oxidize and become unstable or rancid. Finally, oils like corn oil are high in omega-6 fatty acids, which are linked with increased inflammation. Both Crisco's peanut oil and frying oil blends are designed to be good for frying, but they include additives like TBHQ, which, as discussed previously, may be linked to health problems. As for its canola oil, they add in omega-3s, making it arguably a more heart-healthy option. But a word to the wise, this oil comes with a warning — it will catch fire if overheated. Crisco offers a five-product line of cooking sprays. These sprays are highly pressurized canisters of various types of vegetable oil that also all include a few undesirable ingredients. For most people, soy lecithin is a benign food additive used as a lubricant, in this case to help prevent sticking. According to Healthline, it's usually added in such small amounts it's unlikely to cause problems. That said, if you have a severe soy allergy, talk to your doctor about using products that contain it. According to Chosen Foods, dimethyl silicone, an anti-foaming agent, may be harmless in small amounts, but it hasn't been researched extensively, and it's unclear if there could be negative health effects. One thing to keep in mind, it's also included in things like cosmetics and textile finishing products. Obviously, to spray a cooking oil, you need something to encourage this release from its pressurized can. It's unclear what type of propellant Crisco uses, but according to Chosen Foods, common choices include nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, propane, and butane or isobutane. So yeah, it's up to you whether you want a quick spray of propane in your foods. Coconut oil is one of those oils that for years was vilified for being high in saturated fat content. But as science mounted in the 2000s, indicating that plant-based saturated fats like coconut oil might not be as heart-unhealthy as previously thought, coconut oil made a comeback. According to Healthline, one thing that differentiates the saturated fats in coconut oil from saturated fats in animal fats is that most of these saturated fats are considered medium-chain fatty acids rather than long-chain fatty acids. Medium-chain fatty acids seem to boost heart health rather than hurting it. For instance, lauric acid, which accounts for 42% of coconut oil, has a positive effect on increasing HDL — good cholesterol. Stearic acid, also found in coconut oil, can help lower LDL — bad cholesterol — and doesn't appear to have a negative effect on heart health. And finally, capric acid, which is about 4% of coconut oil, is rapidly metabolized, has been linked to weight loss, increased insulin sensitivity, and anti-seizure effects. To be clear, more research still needs to be done. But early headlines pushing coconut oil as a heart-healthy option had companies clamoring to add coconut oil to their line of products. Crisco was no different, and now sells two types — refined organic and unrefined organic. The main difference is the refined version has been processed to eliminate the coconut flavor and smell from the oil. Little Caesars unveils the recipe to their pizza that's ready when you are. With fresh ingredients and a dough made in-house, discover the savory secrets that make their pies a slice above the rest. Little Caesars Hot and Ready Pizza is one of the wonders of the fast food world. As one commenter on the Straight Dope forum tells it, Went by Little Caesars drive-thru last night, ordered the three meat hot and ready. 
The lady had it in her hand when I pulled up to the window. How are they making this magic happen? Some have speculated that Little Caesars is just nuking frozen pizzas. And according to USA Today, there was even a scandal when a viral video seemed to indicate that the frozen pizzas in question were actually DiGiorno. However, what was shown in the video was just a coincidence, with the customer having a cart full of previously purchased frozen pizzas while they stopped at one of Little Caesars' locations inside of a Kmart. But while Little Caesars' hot and ready pizza is not your top-of-the-line wood fire pizza with buffalo mozzarella and artisan pancetta, it is, at least, made from scratch. Little Caesars changed the hot and ready classic and added 33% more pepperoni, which makes it 133% better pizza than before. Several past and present Little Caesars employees on Quora offered similar descriptions of how the restaurant chain preps their pizza. First, batches of dough are mixed up every day, though they may be refrigerated for up to three days before being used. The fresh sauce is also prepared daily from bagged tomato paste mixed with their own spice blend and water. When it's time to make the pizzas, the dough is stretched onto a cornmeal-coated pan and marked with a three-hour expiration time. Prior to baking, a medium pizza crust is coated with four ounces of sauce, sprinkled with five ounces of cheese, and, unless intended to be plain, dressed with toppings. The pizzas are then loaded into racks and baked via a conveyor belt oven for five to six minutes. After the pizza comes out of the oven, it's sliced up and packaged in a cardboard box branded with the chain's distinctive logo, featuring a toga-clad, laurel-wreathed Julius Caesar. Happy as a Roman emperor can be, the cartoon Caesar gobbles down a slice of pizza while the rest of the pie is impaled on his spear. Many of these boxed pizzas will find their way into a hot and ready warmer, something that's been a Little Caesar's mainstay since 1997. The maximum amount of time a pizza will spend in that warmer should be just 30 minutes. After that duration, the pizzas are deemed to be insufficiently fresh for walk-in customers. But that doesn't mean that these slightly past their prime pizzas will go to waste. An article published in the Martinsville, Indiana Reporter Times indicates that their local Little Caesars has been known to donate unsold pizzas to an organization that distributes food to the economically disadvantaged. Up until just recently, one place that the Little Caesars hot and ready pizzas would not go was into a delivery vehicle. While the chain did offer delivery service in the 20th century, for the past two decades, Little Caesars preferred to outsource the function to third-party operators such as Grubhub and DoorDash. Apparently, the general feeling toward this decision was that the delivery market was so crowded and competitive, the chain felt that it was best to outsource the delivery and put its focus on walk-in customers. With the kind of timing that makes you wonder if Little Caesars employs a company psychic, they chose to re-implement delivery in January of 2020. The chain had felt it could finally provide the service in a cost-effective manner, and the move proved to be beneficial when suddenly, just weeks later, delivery was the only game in town. I'm sure they've got it down to a science. Well, that and drive through but not all Little Caesars locations offer this option either. Delivering pizzas to those homebound by the pandemic proved pretty profitable for the chain, but it gave back to the community too, and donated numerous pizzas to healthcare workers and first responders. Perhaps partly as a result of this goodwill, or just the added convenience of delivery, sales figures kept on growing even after the lockdown ended. With so much momentum, the chain doesn't appear to be slowing its roll anytime soon.